All right, so terms that we're going to uh, begin learning today is so we've already talked about some solutions uh, last week. We, we dealt with uh, reactions, precipitation, acid base reactions, uh, combustion, you know, not combustion, but combination decomposition. Uh, and we, we came across this term here uh, that we've already seen here where we're talking about what we call aqueous solutions. <laughs> so simple solutions have two parts to them. Uh, one part is the solute, and that's what we're going to be dissolving. And then we have what we call, consider the solvent, which is the compound that does the dissolving. So if I were to take some salt, put it into some water, well, the salt would be considered my solute, and the water would be considered the solvent. Uh, if I put sugar into water, sugar is the solute and the water again is a solvent and because water is a solvent that's actually a necessary requirement when we're talking about aqueous solution is that water must be <clears throat> the solvent in order to have an aqueous solution so we can have solutions that aren't aqueous uh, I, I Take some Nest Quick, strawberry Nest Quick, uh, my solute, put it into uh, some milk, and I can make a solution out of that. But is it an aqueous solution? No, it's not. A, it's not an aqueous solution. It's not an aqueous solution, uh, but it is nonetheless still a solution. It's a simple solution where we have solute and solvent. It's just not an aqueous solution. For us to have an aqueous solution, we do need to have that. Uh, so here, like on the right here, I'm sorry, on the left here, we see that beat to the, that seawater, um, and the seawater is a solution. It's an aqueous solution uh, with a bunch of minerals in it. Salt happens to be one of the uh, minerals, or you know, that's or one of the elements that's in salt water. So we get uh, an aqueous solution out of this salt water. And then we have this. Uh, word on the street is this is a really delicious drink. Not that I drink these myself or know how to make this uh, lovely looking drink here, but this image on the right uh, we're look, it looks like Modelo in it. And then on, on this this stuff right here, it's called tahine if you didn't know that. Uh, I know that because, well, <laughs> word on the street is I know what this is. Uh, so here it, it does mix in with the Modelo. And you get this really nice tasting uh, drink inside of that. I'm not telling you guys to make these. I'm just telling you that I hear these taste pretty good. But is it an aqueous solution? No, it's not an aqueous solution by any means. But it is still a simple solution. Uh, not like the aqueous solution we see over here with salt water. <clears throat> uh, but solutions don't necessarily have to be made out of uh, dissolving a solid. It's not necessary to always dissolve uh, a solid. Is that we can take liquids and dissolve it into another liquid. Right? So we can take, uh, if we see that, that image on the left, we see that beaker with uh, yellow liquid and uh, beaker with blue liquid. And then when they're mixed together, they mix together very uniformly, that it doesn't separate at all. We see it turn into this green solution here. <clears throat> so we take this liquid here and this liquid over here, and this is what we're going to consider to be miscible. So this is a miscible solution because we're dissolving a liquid into another liquid to come up with some solution. <clears throat> Unlike the other image here, where we see this separation, I have I have this layer of oil, then we have this other layer of water because it didn't mix, and this is what we're going to deem <clears throat> as immiscible. So now we have a few terms to understand there. So we have solute, solvent, we have aqueous solutions, or solutions that aren't aqueous but nonetheless still solutions, and then solutions made out of liquids where, where they're either going to be miscible or immiscible solutions. Now, going back to solute and solvent, uh, depending on how much solute is in the solvent, uh, we have a range of what we consider concentrated solutions and dilute solutions. So something, uh, a solution that is concentrated is going to have a relatively 
large amount of solute in that solution. And then something that's very dilute has a relatively small amount of solute. And then we have that range that's completely in between there. So a range of increasing or decreasing amount of solute, however you look at it, where we have something that's highly concentrated or something that's highly dilute, depending on how much of that solute we have when we dissolved it in the solvent. So <clears throat> these solvents, whether it's water, milk, medela, whatever these solvents are, the solvents, when they dissolve the solute, it can't continuously dissolve solute. If I have um, an eight ounce cup of water and I put in, let's say, half a teaspoon of salt and I put it in there and I mix it around and it dissolves really nicely. <clears throat> but there's only so much of it that it's going to dissolve. I, if I put 50 teaspoons of salt into my water, well, chances are is that a really large amount is going to go undissolved and just sit at the bottom of the cup. So there is a limit here. <clears throat> there is a limit as to uh, how much solvents can actually dissolve. Right? So in the first example over here, right, we have 30 grams of salt here. It's put into the beaker. It's stirred around. And we can see that all of it has been dissolved. And if all of it's been dissolved, we consider that an unsaturated solution because all of that solute was dissolved. And then we get to this next example here, right? We get 40, which is only about 10 grams difference here. But if we take 40 grams and put it into the same beaker and we swish it around, we notice here <coughs> that only 36 grams of it dissolved. There's four grams that just sitting at the bottom because that solvent is now saturated with the sodium chloride and it can't dissolve anything else. Once we get to the saturated solution, that solvent has reached its solubility limit. That it doesn't matter how much more salt, I can keep adding more salt and more salt, stir it faster, but it's still not going to dissolve that the solution is saturated and the solvent has reached its solubility limit. So <clears throat> water makes this great solvent. Water is known as what we consider a universal solvent. So water is known as a universal solvent and water has dissolved more substances than any other chemical because of its polarity. If we go back, if we go back a, a couple of chapters and we talked about polarity, is that recall that this oxygen is partially negative and this hydrogen is partially positive. So when we put an ionic compound, let's say we take some salt, some sodium chloride, the sodium is positively charged, the chlorine is negatively charged. Well, if I put a water molecule around this, let's put one water molecule here, and let's put another water molecule here. <coughs> let's recall now that the oxygen is partially, sorry, partially negative. and that the hydrogen is partially positive. Well, what happens here is this negative, partially negative oxygen starts to build an attraction to that sodium there. And this partially positive hydrogen starts to build an attraction to that negatively charged uh, chlorine there. And that is actually strong enough to break up that ionic compound is that the slightly negative and positive charge of water is enough to overcome this ionic bond and separate it into different ions.
And water has the ability to do that. Water's not the only one that has the ability to do that, but water is very polar. And as long as we have these, these polar bonds, we'll look at a couple other examples here. We see uh, ammonia here. So ammonia, which has a partially positive charge on the hydrogen, partially negative charge on the nitrogen, uh, is that if I take another ammonia and I give it these charges of partially positive, partially negative, partially positive, partially positive, is that we're going to see an attraction. This partially positive hydrogen This partially positive hydrogen is going to form an attraction to that partially negative end of nitrogen. And this is what we consider a hydrogen bond. Uh, water, and you know, let me draw water. If I were to draw a water molecule here, well, water. Oxygen is partially negative, while hydrogen is partially positive. Is that again? We can see another hydrogen bond forming here. So here we have another hydrogen bond, and just hydrogen bonds are bonds that are made between molecules. They involve hydrogen, and they're made between molecules. And just so there's no confusion, this is not a hydrogen bond. We've already talked about these bonds before. This is a nonmetal bonded to another nonmetal, and this is a polar covalent bond. So that's a polar, I know that there's hydrogen there, but this is a polar covalent bond, which is much different than a hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonds occur between molecules. So if I wanted another <coughs> hydrofluoric acid here, I could draw HF, partially positive, partially negative, and there's gonna be an attraction here between that fluorine and that positively, partially positive uh, charged hydrogen there uh, forming it. And once we start forming all of these, these bonds here, is that we really start building a network. So all of these here are what we consider uh, hydrogen bonds here. So all of these here, this is, uh, this is oxygen, hydrogen, it's hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen, hydrogen. And all of these here, we just start building uh, an entire network of hydrogen bonds. Right. Um, so as far as dissolving, we're, I, I have a better image. So here, when we go back to water being this universal solvent and, and how, how these ionic compounds dissolve and how they're separated is that the phenomenon doing that is what we call hydration. So this, and, and let's just remember, just to remind you here, that this is an ionic compound, that it is a metal bonded to a non-metal, right? So it's a metal bonded to a non-metal, and when we hydrate it, is that it splits up into uh, cations and anions of sodium and chloride. So we get sodium and chloride ions, and they end up just being surrounded by a bunch of water. And I, have, I actually have a better image of that as, as what happens when it's actually dissolving here. So here we have this block of potassium chloride. It's not sodium chloride, but it's still an ionic compound with potassium and chloride. Uh, still uh, uh, an alkali metal, group one metal here. <coughs> but we see here that all of these atoms are surrounded by water. So we get this positively 
partially positive end of hydrogen attracted to the negative end of chlorine. We have this partially negative end of oxygen being attracted to the positive end of this potassium. And so individually, one by one, is that these atoms are individually removed one atom at a time. And they're surrounded by these water molecules. Uh, and we talked about the solubility limit. This water molecule that I've just kind of circled right here, it's not surrounding any ions yet. This is what we consider a free water molecule. It's free, it's floating around, and it's not been, uh, it hasn't dissolved any ions just yet. But when we talk about solubility limit, and the solvent, the water here, uh, not being able to dissolve some of the solute. Well, that happens because there's only a limited amount of these free water molecules that eventually all of these free water molecules will end up surrounding all of these atoms here. And eventually, if we put too much solute into the solution that there's that we run out of these free water molecules and if we don't have any more that's why the rest of that solute just remains unchanged right it just sits at the bottom of that beaker uh, undissolved because we don't have any more there uh, give me one second here All right, so this is how ionic compounds dissolve. Ionic compounds dissolve this way. Now, covalently bonded molecules, these nonmetal elements that are bonded to other nonmetal elements, these covalent molecules, they don't dissolve the same way. They dissolve much differently. So, <coughs> So when we look at these covalently bonded molecules, this is sucrose, C12H2211. This is not like our ionic compounds. We put this in here, we add some water, and we break it up into sodium, and we break it up into chlorine. So Covalently bonded molecules don't dissolve the same way. We're not going to break this up into carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. There's no ions formed here. So that does not occur when we're trying to dissolve them. We can get it to dissolve. I can put sugar into water and it does dissolve. But the manner in which it dissolves is very different. Is that we're going to see, I have an image, and we're going to see all of the polar bonds that are capable of making a hydrogen bond with a water molecule. So this is the image of sucrose here. This is our structure of sucrose. <clears throat> and there are plenty of polar bonds involving oxygen and hydrogen is that here hydrogen is partially positive oxygen partially negative hydrogen partially positive oxygen partially negative <clears throat> so that if a water molecule were to come in here it could definitely make a hydrogen bond <clears throat> with that positively charged hydrogen, is that we could make a hydrogen bond
between this oxygen and this hydrogen, between this hydrogen and this oxygen. So this is what happens when water comes in here, is that all of these polar uh, <clears throat> oxygen-hydrogen bonds, water's gonna come in here and water starts to surround the entire thing. So you notice that it's not picking it apart. We're not separated into hydrogens or oxygens or carbons, is that water molecules will be attracted to all of those oxygen hydrogen polar bonds just as we see this water molecule coming here right so i have a hydrogen bond another hydrogen bond another hydrogen bond so all these hydrogen bonds are formed and this will be surrounded uh completely by water the entire molecule so if we have a large structure here so here's my block of sugar right i put in a big block of sugar and i throw it into water and then a molecule, we take one entire molecule, and that entire molecule gets surrounded by water. So here's sucrose here, and we surround the entire thing with water. Here's another sucrose molecule, and we surround the entire thing with water. So there's a huge difference on how these uh, covalently bonded molecules dissolve in water versus how ionic compounds dissolve in water. So once we get these ions from these ionic compounds, is that these ions are what we're gonna consider electrolytes, right? They are <clears throat> electrolytes because they do have the potential to conduct electricity. Electrolytes will conduct electricity. Unlike these covalently bonded molecules, they can put sugar into water, <clears throat> but as we just seen, Right? There's no ions that are formed here. That sucrose does not be become positively charged or negatively charged, and we don't get any ions from that. So those are what we're going to consider to be non-electrolytes. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> we've covered quite a bit of terms here. Talking about electrolytes, non-electrolytes, uh, hydration, we're talking about dissolving uh, some ionic compounds is, is now we're going to get into uh, some calculations here. So <clears throat> there's uh, two ways that we're going to deal with solution concentration. This is our first way. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, concentration based off of moles. And then we'll deal with concentration based off of dilution. If, if we add more solvent to dilute this concentration, we'll be able to calculate uh, some final volumes and some final concentrations. Uh, but again, concentration based off dilution. So our first one is solution concentration. And that is our mass volume percent. Now, <clears throat> This statement here is a definition. And if we take a look at it, I need to make sure that we are aware of this. So this mass percent volume, this mass percent volume is defined as the mass in grams, the mass in grams divided by the volume in milliliters multiplied by 100. This is a definition that you absolutely have to memorize. You're going to see it here. For those of you uh, trying to get into allied health programs, you guys are going to have to take physio. And you're going to be doing, for the first month, you're going to do calculations regarding this, these units here, uh, the, these solution concentrations, this definition here. So it's a definition you absolutely have to know is this percent mass to volume is equal to grams per milliliter multiplied by 100. So that every time you see this, this is what you're gonna think. And this is equal to percent grams per milliliter. So when you see percent mass to volume, you know that that's percent 
grams per milliliter. When, when you multiply something by 100, that puts it into a percentage. So some rules about percentage, because we're going to be dealing with those for the next few uh, problems here, is that if you multiply something by 100, it puts it into a percentage. And in order to remove a percentage, well, then we're going to divide it by 100. So a percentage rule that we need to understand. So again, if you want to put it into a percent, multiply by 100. You want to take it out of a percent, divide it by 100. So here our concentration is in grams, so the amount of solute in grams over the amount of solution in milliliters, and that is our concentration. So let's look at a, let's look at a problem here, and again, absolutely remember this and memorize this here. Percent gram, I'm sorry, percent. Percent mass to volume is equal to percent grams per milliliter. And memorize that definition. So if we go to the next problem, I, I already expect you to memorize this definition. Like it's been a minute since I showed this to you. But you absolutely have to memorize that definition of percent grams per mil. So that when we go to problems, we'll come back to this mass part per, but when we go to these problems here, uh, here it is already, we already see it right off the bat. And if you don't have that memorized percent mass to volume, you don't know how to calculate this answer. So it's asking us to calculate the percent MV. So what it's actually asking us to calculate is we need to calculate the percent grams per milliliter because that's the definition we just memorized for percent MV. So I need to take this information here of milligrams and this information here of milliliters and I also, so I have to convert these milligrams to grams. I have to make sure that the volume is in the denominator and I have to make sure that I multiply it by 100 to give me my percent because that's our definition, right? Grams over mills multiplied by 100. So here, when we're dealing with solution, real quick, when we're dealing with this solution here, uh, I can definitely write this, 3.50 milliliters. If we look at our problem here, well, it's asking us to put the volume in the denominator. And right now, uh, and I've shown you this trick in the very first lab, uh, I kind of showed you this trick here, is that we can always just put a one under it. And right now, the 3.50 mils is sitting in the numerator, but we're chemists. We get to do crazy stuff here. And look at this. I can also write it like this. Boom. And now all of a sudden, if I write it this way, my volume is in the denominator. So I'm going to go ahead and set this up now. So let's go ahead and set this up. So there's our 102 milligrams. If we need to get to percent grams per milliliter, well, I have to convert milligrams into grams. So by that, we just need a conversion factor that's going to do that. So 1,000 milligrams for every gram here. So that's going to be our first step is to convert that milligrams into grams. And then these units here will cancel out. And now I have grams of potassium chloride. So we're one step closer into finding this percent grams per mil for calculating it. So our next step is to take care of this volume and make sure it's in the denominator and I've already shown you that trick there on how to put that in the denominator. So again, these units are canceled out here. I have grams, I have milliliter, and my last and final step, percent grams per mil, right, is we're going to take these grams over the milliliters and we multiply that by simply just 100. So if we multiply that by 100, 
That's going to give us our percentage. So these are canceled out. We have grams, we have mils, and this will put it into percent. So now we just need to make the calculation. And we end up having 2.91 uh, percent grams per milliliter. This is an answer for it, uh, but uh, health professionals are kind of funny. Um, is that this is not how you're going to see it in physio, and you may not see it like this in the nursing program, right? But uh, if you've ever seen it before, uh, this isn't the only way to write it. We can actually write it like this, 2.91%. Potassium chloride. And this is done in the health profession all the time. Is that you've seen maybe, maybe you've seen this before. Well, let's say I have a 2% glucose solution. What they're expecting you to know is that they're expecting you to know that this is implied. So when you guys go to physio, when you guys take your T-test, whatever it is, is that it's implied that you know what that means. That when they say 2% glucose, and you look at that, and you're, you're supposed to be making calculations of physio, and you go, there's no units here. What the heck am I supposed to do with 2% glucose? And then you're going to think back, and you're going to go, oh, you know what? That Friday morning in lecture with Alex – he told us that we need to know this, is that just because it doesn't say grams per mil doesn't mean that it's not implied here, is that this is equal to 2% grams per milliliter of glucose. And you're going to remember that moment. You're going to go, oh, no, you know what? I actually do have units there because I remember that this 2% is a solution concentration, and my units are in grams per milliliter. And now you guys can make calculations. You can convert this into moles. You can convert it into liters, uh, whatever calculations you guys need to be doing uh, with this solution concentration. So it's implied that even though there's no – units here, it's implied that you already know what those units are. All right, so let's look at, uh, let's go back now, and we'll discuss this uh, parts per, I'm sure you guys have already, maybe have heard that, like parts per hundred, parts per thousand, parts per million, uh, so we'll discuss that. That's also a solution concentration based off of mass and volume. Uh, so here, and we see it again, so our definition of percent MV was that we have the grams divided by the milliliters multiplied by 100. Grams over milliliters multiplied by 100, and there it is, and that is our parts per 100. And when we're doing parts per dilution, is that, well, our, whatever we multiply by, so it doesn't, when we're doing parts per, we don't necessarily have to multiply it by 100. Whatever we multiply by is the dilution factor set when we're talking about PPT, PPM, PPB. But everything else remains the same, is that here we have grams per milliliter, grams per milliliter, grams per milliliter, and if I wanted parts per billion, well, then I would take my grams per mil and multiply it by a billion. If I want parts per thousand, I'm going to take my grams per milliliter, and I multiply it by a thousand. So we're going to have, a, so let's take a look at a problem now involving parts per. And here's our first problem. So here, parts per million. So this is parts per million. 
and I know that this is a solution concentration, so I know that I'm going to take my grams and I'm going to divide it by my milliliters, and since it's parts per million, I'm going to multiply it by one million. And it's the same setup if we did this. I could take grams per mil, and I could multiply it by this as well. They both represent the same thing, that 10 to the 6 is equal to 1 million. Uh, you'll get the exact same answer uh, either way. So let's go ahead and say that, because we do have our grams. We do have milliliters, so grams, milliliters. We're just going to divide one into the other, so let's set that up. So here's the 9.25 grams of potassium chloride, and we're going to divide it by the volume. So here it is. We have 664 milliliters. And then, because it's parts per million, we're going to multiply it by 1 million. So here I'm using 10 to the 6. And it doesn't matter. You'll get the exact same answer for those that aren't comfortable using 10 to the 6 is that if you set it up the same way and you multiply it by 1 million is that you still end up with 13,900. I rounded it to three significant figures because it was three significant figures. PPM of potassium chloride. Right? So uh, either way you do it, you still get the exact same answer there. Right, so this is going to be what we're going to consider parts per dilution. And as a reminder, um, is that we do our grams uh, divided by the grams divided by the volume in milliliters, and you multiply it by whatever the dilution factor. I'm sorry, not the dilution, but whatever the uh, yeah, whatever the dilution factor is when we're talking about parts per million or parts per billion, hundred, thousand, uh, as we divide uh, or multiply it by those values there. All right, uh, back to some more mass percent volumes. So here, um, I don't. Uh, my eyes. <coughs> are drawn to something already. I haven't even read the question yet, but because I've been doing this for quite some time, and I'm hoping that you guys get into the same exact habit, is that my eyes are drawn to this. And I haven't even read the question yet. As soon as I see it, it's just reflex at this point. And with you guys, it also just needs to be reflex. Is that as soon as I see this, there's no way that I'm going to make a calculation involving M and involving V. Is that I need something more usable. Is my first reaction even looking at this is not even to do the, not even to read the question, but to transform this into percent grams of sodium chloride per milliliter so that I'm not bothered by this because now when it's asking me a question now I'm going to go back and read the question and I says okay calculate the number of grams in 300 mils of a 1.50 percent grams per mil solution of sodium chloride and this is much easier on my eyes is that I notice oh here's grams grams I can get rid of my milliliters because I have that information here, uh, and I know how to get it out of a percentage, and I'm going to divide it by 100. So it becomes a much easier setup because I immediately transform that percent MV into something more useful. So that's going to be my initial step here. So my initial step is to convert that into something more usable, and here we have it, 1.50% grams per mil of sodium chloride. So now the question's asking us to calculate the number of grams. So if I use the volume here, that these milliliters are going to cancel out these milliliters. And again, just as a reminder, Aaron, I'm looking to calculate the grams. I do have grams, but I still have this percent that I have to deal with. So as far as the percent goes, uh, I've already told you guys how, to, how we get rid of percentages. We're going to divide it by 100. 
So if we divide that by 100, here it is. And this removes the percent. So we can get rid of this percentage. The units of milliliters are gone. And now we can just go ahead and calculate it because it's asking for grams and that is my only unit left is grams. So we end up with 4.5 grams of sodium chloride. So again, um, try and, and make it a habit, a uh, reflex, that as soon as you see this, we have to get rid of it. Because we're not going to work in, in percent MVs that we need units that we can actually cancel out. Right? So here we are, same situation. I haven't even read the problem yet, but mm, this is an eyesore for me. I I don't know what I'm going to do here, but the first, as far as the calculation goes, but the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this. So that I don't have to look at this anymore. And now I'm going to read the question here. So, okay, so we got calculate the number of moles of sodium chloride in a 120 mil solution. Well, I know how to deal with this because that's going to take care of these milliliters. But it is asking us for moles, and all I have is grams. But we did spend the last couple of lectures, and we do know a process to calculate or to convert grams into moles, and just the opposite, we can calculate moles and turn them into grams. And that, we go to the periodic table. And what we're going to get is we're going to get our molar mass, our units of grams over moles. So let's do that for sodium chloride. So for sodium chloride, if we look at the periodic table, uh, sodium is 22.99 grams per mole, and chlorine is 35.45 grams per mole. And I'm going to simply add those up, and I get 58.44 grams per mole. But I'm going to take an extra 10 seconds here. I'm going to use 10 seconds up, and I'm going to rewrite this into something that's a little bit better for me. 58.44 grams of sodium chloride per mole. Or for every mole, I have 58.44 grams of sodium chloride. Right. And that only took about 10 seconds. I didn't really waste any time. I just used up 10 seconds to actually give me something uh, a little more usable here. Uh, so now when I read the question, calculate the number of moles in 120 milliliters, well, I have to get rid of these grams, and I can plainly see, I can see clearly, I can clearly see that it's 58.44 grams in the denominator. And that is going to help me eliminate these grams of sodium chloride here. So I'm glad I took that extra 10 seconds to write both of these out. So it's not a waste of time to do that. Uh, we don't, we don't want to rush this. So let's go ahead and set that up. So we've made our change here. And we've written 5.0% gram sodium chloride per milliliter. Uh, we're going to use our volume here in order to go ahead and cancel out those units. Uh, so here I have, we, we, need to, we need to get to moles here, right? We have to get to moles, which means we have to remove this, and we know how to do that. We divide it by 100. Uh, we just came up with two, these conversion factors. So 
here we're going to use this one here. So let's go ahead and set that up again. And there's, uh, we divide it by 100. So again, remember, this is going to remove this percentage. So we move this percentage here because we divide it by 100. These units are still canceled out. And here we have our molar mass, right? So just as a reminder, this is our molar mass. Uh, and this comes from the periodic table. I don't make those units up. They come from the periodic table. But now we get to cancel those out. And the only units left is just moles. So we have moles of sodium chloride. Okay. And then we just can continue with our answer here. So uh, I'll rewrite everything in here because I'm going to upload these notes for you guys. So uh, this uh, removes the percent. These units of milliliters cancel out. And then grams cancels out grams. Uh, and we end up with 0 0.10 moles of sodium chloride. I'll leave that up there for a second. All right. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. So let's move on to another. Okay, so this is just kind of something we, we've we've kind of revisited or done already. And here, I see this. I need the definition that we, we should have memorized. That percent MV, what it's asking us to calculate is we're asked to calculate percent grams per milliliter. All right, so I'm going to take all this information here. I'm going to take this information here and do everything I can in order to get it into the right format. Uh, 15 moles here. I don't have grams, but you know what? That 10 seconds we used in order to come out with both of these conversion factors is that now I'm going to use this one. So I can use this one here, and that's going to help set this problem up here. So calculate the percent grams per milliliter. So our first step is to take this information here, moles, and we're going to convert that into grams. So we take our molar mass here. There we go, and we cancel those units out, and I'm one step closer now. I'm one step closer because I have converted into grams. Uh, we know how to deal with the milliliters and put those in the denominator, and we also know how to put it into a percent, and that's multiply by 100. So if we take those additional steps here, here it is. My volume's in the denominator. While these units are canceled out, so I have grams, I have mils, and I have one final step here. And that last and final step is to multiply it by 100. And that will put it into a percentage. All right, so these units are canceled. These units canceled. Uh, and then we have grams, mils, and we have our percent. And we end up with 8.8 .8 grams per mil sodium chloride. Or if you're, at, uh, uh, if you're in the uh, allied health uh, industry, it would be 8.8% .8 sodium chloride, assuming that we already know that that represents grams per mil, right? All right. All right, so that would cover everything that we have for uh, solution concentration. Solution concentration based on the mass of the solute over the volume of solution. So now we'll do concentration based on moles. And this is what we know as molarity. 
So molarity is the moles of our solute divided by the liters of solution we have. And then we have units that represent moles per liter. And I'm kind of a stickler. If, if we're doing, if we're working on the lab, is that molarity is a capital M. This represents molarity, capital M. If you're doing the lab and you write this for molarity, it does not equal molarity. When I see that, I think of meters, not molarity. And I point that out, and then students go, oh, I'm sorry, Alex, my mistake. And then they all they do is they write a large lowercase m. And that's not molarity still. This does not mean molarity just because you made it larger. Is that we use a capital, capitalized M, capital M, and that will represent our molarity, right? A capitalized M. All right. Uh, and again, and this will represent our units of moles per liter. So capital M. So kind of another definition that you do need to uh, memorize. So we, we talked about it. So it's important to remember our, our mass percent volume is equal to percent grams per milliliter. Uh, and then it's also important to know uh, that moles, I'm sorry, that molarity, or we can term it molar for short, uh, is that molar or molarity is moles over liters. So if we know that definition of M equals moles over liters, we can actually look at a few problems now. So here it is, it's asking us to find the molarity. So this is a definition we need to know. Well, what is molarity equal to? Well, molarity is equal to this capital M, which is equal to moles per liter. Well, if I know what molarity is because I've memorized the definition, it wants us to do moles and divide it by the number of liters. So that's a really simple setup here, is we're just gonna take the number of moles, 0 0.50 moles calcium chloride, and we're gonna divide it by the liters of solution, 0 0.265 liters. And then we can go ahead and calculate that out. So if we calculate that out, uh, we get moles over liters, and this represents our molarity. Uh, but we're not actually finished here. I do have 1.9 moles per liter, and that kind of answers the question, but it's not the final answer, is that we do actually have to make that final change and actually convert it back into this capital M, which represents molarity. Is that, yes, moles per liter are the units of molarity, but as a final answer, we would want to see the capital M instead of moles over liters. We'd want to see 1.9, this capital M for molar, so 1.9 molar calcium chloride. And again, when I say molar, uh, it's just shortcut for molarity. So molarity and molar uh, mean the same thing when we're talking about this. Uh, okay, moving on. I hope let me hide some of that information there. All right, so again, it's asking us for molarity. And because we've memorized that, we know that molarity represents moles over liters. <clears throat> well, we definitely have volume here, and we know how to deal with that, and we know how to put that in the denominator. But I don't have moles. The only thing I have is grams, so we're going to have to go from grams to moles. And how do we do that? Well, we're going to need the molar mass, which means that we're going to need the periodic table for calcium chloride. So here's calcium, here's chloride. I have one calcium at 40.08, and there's two chlorines at 35.45. And again, these values that I've just written down, they come from the periodic table, right? Um, I just know them off the bat because I've been dealing with them for so long, but I, I don't make the values up, uh, is that you do, you, uh, you will find these on the periodic table. Uh, so, 
70.90, 40 40.08, so we come out with 110.98 grams per mole. And again, what I do here is I'm going to take an extra 10 seconds, and I'm going to write this into something much more useful for me. 110.98 grams of calcium chloride for every mole of calcium chloride. And I'm going to write for every mole of calcium chloride, I have 110.98 grams of calcium chloride. And it's not a waste of time to do that. Because as soon as I do that, and I'm looking at this question, uh, 55 grams, well, I, need, I know that I need to go from grams to moles. And if I look at my setup, I can say, wow. Look at that, I already know which one to use now. Is that in order to get rid of these grams of calcium chloride, well here it is. And this is the one I'm gonna use. So this is what the setup looks like. So our setup looks like this, where here we have this molar mass that's gonna cancel out these units here. It's asking us for molarity, which is moles over liters. I have moles over liters, and we have 0 0.044 molar, and I should finish this off. This is of calcium chloride. That's unfinished, right? 0 0.044 molar Kool-Aid, I guess. No, but I, I, we, we did put it in here now, so it is for 0 0.044 molar calcium chloride. Okay. So it's never a waste of time to do that, to, to write both of these out is that that literally took me 10 seconds to do, uh, and, and it's actually worth the 10 seconds so that I can visually see what units I need to cancel out. <laughs> All right, um, another one, let's do another one. A little different setup. It's asking me for moles, um, but again, I have some habits, and I don't think they're bad habits is that when I, I, I don't really read the question just yet, what I'm looking at is my eyes are drawn to this. And I'm thinking, big M, these questions here, in the calculation, in all the calculations we've done, if we look at this calculation, there's no big M. If we look at this calculation here, there's no big M. Is that, this large M is not part of any calculations we've done. So my thought is that I'm going to change this real quick into moles per liter. So that now I have something a little bit better to look at than just a 0 0.300. Because I have something a little bit better to look at instead of looking at this. So now that I can clearly read the question here, how many moles, well, here's my moles, are needed to make a 2.5 liter solution. Well, I can definitely use this yes. to cancel this out, and I know how many moles of calcium chloride I'm gonna need. So if we go ahead and we set that up correctly, let me get to a couple, there we go. So here, uh, it's asking us how many moles. So if we have our setup here, and again, this comes from this up here, is that we can use this and, and use the volume here in order to cancel those units out. So this is gonna answer our question of just how many moles we have. So we can make the calculation 0 0.300 moles of calcium chloride multiplied by 2.5 liters. And we end up with this answer here Yep, we have our moles. Uh, yeah, that answers our question here. The 0 0.75 moles of calcium chloride. All right, moving on here. Uh, again, 
another situation here, pretty similar, is that that my as soon as I look at this, I, I haven't fully read the question yet. I've kind of glanced at it, but here it is again. See that big M. For me and for you, step number one. Uh, let me see if that's causing an issue. There we go. Uh, so for me, uh, if that's an issue here, is that I'm going to just go uh, and change this to zero point. 250 moles of sodium chloride per liter. <clears throat> and this way, I don't have to look at that anymore. And now I'm going to read my question, and it says calculate the mass in grams of sodium chloride. Well, liters we know how to deal with because we can take care of that. So our mass in grams, well, this is another issue. I have moles, but I need grams, so we're going to have to convert moles into grams using molar mass. All right, so we go to the periodic table, but we've already done that before. We've gone to the periodic table, 58.44 grams of sodium chloride per mole of sodium chloride. So that's what we did previously. If you, if, we, if we need a little reminder of where it came from. Uh, nope, that's potassium chloride. Or not potassium, calcium chloride. Uh, oh, we did it way up there. A little too far up then. Uh, is that <clears throat> we get that from the periodic table. Uh, sodium's 22.99, chloride's 35.45. We add them both together and we come out with this molar mass here. So this molar mass, well, I don't think we're going to need this reciprocal value here, so we can actually just go ahead and set this up now. Uh, and if we set this up correctly, uh, again, here, this comes from here, where we actually change it from units from molar uh, into more usable units of moles over liters. Then we're going to use this volume here in order to cancel out those units. And then we're going to use our molar mass in order to convert from moles into grams. So here, these units will cancel. These units cancel. And I am just left with grams of sodium chloride when it's asking us how much sodium chloride we're going to need to add to 1 and half liters to get that concentration. So we can calculate that out now. And I'll recancel these units for you guys. And we end up with 21.9 grams of sodium chloride. All right. Uh, I also want to take one from your guys' homework. There was, uh, I thought there was a really good one here, uh, which actually gives us a, a little more insight into some of these uh, calculations here. So uh, if you do have your textbooks, the problem on the homework on 5-14, I'm looking at 5.5. So 5.5, and I think we'll just do A here. So we have 0 0.85 moles of sodium carbonate, and we have 0 0.74 molar sodium carbonate. And the question is telling us to calculate the volume in liters. So calculate the volume in liters here. Well, I know that I have liters in here because this is moles per liter. So my first step here is to go 0 0.74 moles of sodium chloride, I'm sorry, sodium carbonate per liter. But let's back up a minute here. I'm not, I don't want to go any further with the problem until we kind of look at some previous work that we've done. The mass in grams, and notice the location of my grams. It's in the numerator. How many moles? And look at this. The num 
number of moles is also in my numerator. So anytime we're trying to calculate something, we need those values, we need those values in the numerator. So if we're gonna set this up properly, uh, if we're asked to calculate the volume in liters, well, you know what? I'm gonna need these liters in the numerator. And because we're chemists, we get to do this, right? We get to do crazy stuff in here. So I can actually use the reciprocal value and put 0 0.74 moles sodium carbonate, and I can rewrite it so that my liters are in the numerator. So now we have uh, liters over 0 0.74 moles of sodium carbonate and multiply that by 0 0.85 <laughs> moles of sodium carbonate and that's going to eliminate some units here so these units can cancel out these units and when I multiply them together this is going to equal 1.1 liters. Right, so that's kind of a, um, one that I wanted to show you. To, so it, we should be really comfortable. I think by this point, you guys should be really comfortable with reciprocal values. Is that uh, we need to make sure anytime we're looking for something, we want to make sure those units are in the numerator, uh, unless we have two units to deal with. Well, we and we need one in the numerator and the denominator. But reciprocal values. Anytime we need a reciprocal value, hey, we're chemists. We just flip it around as we need. All right, and I think that'll that'll finish off uh, molarity based off of uh, moles. So the last way we're going to deal with concentration is what we call concentration dilution. So dilution is this process of of adding more solvent. We can add more water uh, into a solution, and that lowers the solute concentration uh, by adding more solvent. Right? Uh, if I have a glass of Nesquik, strawberry Nesquik, and I add more milk, I'm diluting my Nesquik. It's going to taste horrible and not like strawberries, but uh, I can definitely dilute it uh, by adding more milk there. So that's a process that we consider dilution, and we we see this formula here. And this is the formula we're going to use in order to determine uh, these concentrations. So we have what's called C1V1 and C2V2. So C1V1 is our initial concentration, initial volume, and then we have C2V2, which is final concentration, final volume. Uh, but we don't actually need the multiplication sign there. Is that we can actually just rewrite it like this, C1V1 equals C2 V2 and in your textbooks you might also see this I think it's going to look like this in the lab so lab number five has you use this M1 V1 equals M2 V2 and at this point these are interchangeable it doesn't really matter which one you use uh, we know that the capital M stands for molarity, and we know that molarity is a concentration. So uh, initial concentration, initial volume, final concentration, final volume are both represented in either one of these. So they're absolutely interchangeable at this point. Uh, it doesn't matter which one that you use. So, <coughs> excuse me. All right. So the only, um, I think the most difficult part of this, you're, you're always going to be given three out of the four variables. So three out of the four variables you'll always be given. And the, the hardest part here is just kind of getting through the problem. Read the problem and decide what are my initial values and what are my final values and what is it that I'm actually looking for. But the math itself is just multiplication division like anything else that we've been doing. <clears throat> so there's, there's actually two problems here. I should have separated them, but there's two problems here. Uh, so we're going to take a look at the top one first. Uh, I'm going to write down C1V1 equals C2V2. 
And I'll read through the first problem and I'm going to try and find out what my initial and final values are here. So a 35 milliliter sample. Okay, well, if I have this 35 mil sample and I know that milliliters is volume, I know that if I have it, that's going to be my initial volume. And if I dilute this volume, because dilution means adding water <clears throat> or adding solvent, is that if I'm going to dilute that solution and I've added more solvent in here, I know that this is going to be my final volume. And if the concentrated of the diluted solution where I've added water, well, this is going to be my final concentration. And it's now asking me to calculate the concentration in the original solution. So we're going to calculate what that original concentration is. So this is what we're trying to find out as C1. So I'm going to rearrange this real quick. Uh, as a, I'm going to rewrite this as C1 is equal to C2 V2 over V1. And now I can plug all my values in because I know what C2, V2, and V1 are. Is that when I write this, C2 is 0 0.750 molar multiplied by V2, which is 55.0 milliliters, divided by the original volume, 35.0 milliliters. <clears throat> I notice these two units are going to cancel out. And then I could just make the calculation. So if we make the calculation, we have 0 0.750 times 55 divided by 35. Uh, we're going to round to, we'll say three sig figs here. 1.18 molar. And that is our original concentration. This is the value for C1. Uh, I'm actually going to block this off here because we're going to do the other problem as well. So uh, this happens to be done here, and I'll just kind of point an arrow there. <clears throat> well, uh, this one here, uh, we're going to do down here. Okay, so again, I'm going to start off this. Let, let's use M1, V1 this time. So we'll put M1, V1 equals M2, V2. So as I read this, I'm going to try and decipher what I have. So how many milliliters of water should I add to 55 mils? Well, if I'm going to add it to 55 mils, I know this to be my original volume because it's also in milliliters. So I have original volume. <clears throat> and original volume is 55 milliliters of 1.60. This is my original concentration. And I'm going to make this second concentration, <clears throat> uh, which means that what we're going to calculate is we're going to calculate what the final volume is, and that's what we don't know. We don't know what the final volume is. So if we're going to calculate this, I'm going to rearrange this again. So I'm going to go M1, V1 over M2 is equal to V2. Now I know what all my values are, so I'm going to go ahead and plug all of those in. Actually, you know what? Let me rewrite these. I believe I, should, I shouldn't have put C1 here. Instead, this is going to be M2 and M1. <clears throat> all right. So my initial concentration, <clears throat> 1.60 molar, multiplied by initial volume, 55.0 milliliters, divided by a final concentration, 0 0.95 molar. And I notice these units cancel out. And I'm going to have some volume here, <clears throat> 1.60 times 55 divided by 0.95. Uh, I'll round it to two sig figs here. So we get 93 milliliters is equal to V2. <clears throat> but let's look at the question here. I want to make sure we answer the question correctly. 
I know what my final volume is. The final volume is 93 milliliters. The question's asking us how many milliliters of water should I add to 55 mils? In order to dilute this solution to get a 0 0.95 molar concentration, how much water should we add to 55 mils? Well, I know what the final volume should be. The final volume should be 93 mils. So if it's asking us how many milliliters of water should I add to it to get 93 mils, that means in order to answer the question, we need 93 minus 55. And I should add, I should add 38 mils of water to that. If I add 38 milliliters to it, that'll give me a final volume of 93 milliliters in order to make the solution. Um, I kind of did this. This one's a little tricky. I don't know. Uh, your uh, homework may ask you something uh, to this or something. I just uh, want to make sure we kind of covered it here. As far as the exam goes, I would. it'll be more straightforward. It'll be more like the top pretty straightforward, uh, asking you for original, diluted, stuff like that. Uh, but I wouldn't put something this tricky uh, as the second one we did on your, on your, uh, on your exam. So uh, just be aware of that. <coughs> that required just a little too much uh, work and wasted time there. So nothing as difficult as a second one like that. All right. And that brings us into this topic of osmosis. So we're just kind of winding down here. Um, so uh, osmosis, well, this is a process that occurs when um, in a system we have two different concentrations. And the concentrations are separated by some type of membrane. So this membrane here, the only thing that's going to pass back and forth through here is simply just water molecules, is that solute doesn't pass through the membrane. It's too large, and it doesn't pass through. So the only thing we get to pass through here is just simply some water. So what we have here is if we see each side of that membrane here, uh, is that on the left-hand side, we have a high concentration of sugar, our solute. And on the right-hand side, we have, a low, we have a low concentration of solute or sugar here. So <clears throat> what happens with osmosis uh, is that water will diffuse, water will, will pass through that membrane as we see it down uh, next door here, is that water is going to pass through here and it ends up going from an area of low concentration to high concentration. And it does this so that both concentrations are equal on each side of that membrane. Right? And our bodies even do this with our red blood cells, uh, is that for whatever reason, sometimes the concentration uh, surrounding our red blood cells is high or surrounding our red blood cells is a little bit low, and we have water that passes through uh, to, to equalize the concentrations uh, on both sides of that uh, membrane there. So, but if we also notice when, when this occurs, look at this right here is that I have a higher water level here. And this builds up a back pressure uh, from the water preventing, pre so to prevent the water from going back uh, into that lower concentration size. So this is what we consider osmotic pressure. So osmotic pressure, this pressure can be calculated, right? This back pressure can be calculated. And here's our formula in order to calculate that uh, osmotic pressure. So we call it osmolarity, or osmo for short, and we already know what this big M stands for. This big M does represent molarity, a concentration of molarity. So all we have to determine is what this I represents. So I'm going to give you a definition for I. I is going to represent the number of ions. And then I'm going to add a note here. If there are no ions, then I 
Nope. Then I is equal to one. So if there are no ions, I is equal to one. So I is equal to the number of ions. And if there are no ions, then I is simply equal just to the number one. So we're just going to need a little bit of practice to decide or determining what I is. So if we go back to the beginning of the lecture, we talked about hydration and we talked about how uh, electrolytes and non-electrolytes dissolve in water. Recall that sodium chloride, when placed into water, we get ions of sodium and ions of chloride. Well, how many ions are here once we dissolve this? Well, sodium is one, chlorine is one, so our I value would equal two. If we use magnesium chloride, well, now notice that there's two chloride ions. So I'm going to get one ion of magnesium, two ions of chloride, and my I value is going to equal three. If I use aluminum fluoride, I'm going to get one ion of aluminum and three ions of fluoride, and my I value is going to equal four. So it's not difficult to determine for some of these. It does get a little more difficult when we're looking at, oh, let's say uh, we'll use iron. Yeah, let's use um, iron three sulfate. All right, so here, when this splits up into ions, I'm gonna get two ions of iron, and I'm gonna get three ions of sulfate. Which means I'm gonna have a total of five ions here, which means that my I value is equal to five. <clears throat> so here we've had examples of ionic compounds and then the ones involved in polyatomics uh, where we have a different variety. Now let's look at two more examples here. If I were to give you this covalent compound, this non-electrolyte that does not create ions, but is dissolved molecules at a time. This does not break up into carbons, hydrogens, or oxygens, is that this gets surrounded by water, and it's a non-electrolyte, so we don't get any ions. So if there's no ions, then I would equal one. Uh, ethanol, another covalent compound. I could dissolve this in water, but again, it's covalent. It's non-metal bonded to non-metal bonded to non-metal. And this covalent compound, the I value would also equal one because it doesn't make any ions. So using this formula here, we can now calculate uh, osmoles. So let's look at calculating these osmoles here. So in order to calculate osmol, that is equal to molarity multiplied by I. Well, the molarity here is three. And for sodium chloride, I is going to equal two. So three times two, and we have six osmol. So these aren't terribly difficult at all by any means. Uh, I think the hardest part here is just really determining what I is. Uh, we can do the next one over here. <clears throat> sucrose. Well, this is sucrose as a reminder. I've, I've given you guys this before. So this is sucrose. <clears throat> and we use the same formula. Molarity times I. Well, because this is covalent, I is simply just going to equal one. So 
we know what molarity is, that's three. Three times one is equal to three osmole. Uh, we have one more to do here, one more, uh, which is going to be uh, a polyatomic, I believe. So yeah, so, and if you don't know your polyatomics, uh, you're, you're really making it harder on yourself. We have to recognize that that is a polyatomic. So what we get is we get sodium. We actually get two sodium ions, plus we're going to get sulfate. So I is equal to three. If I write the formula for osmol, which is M times I, M is equal to 0 0.15 times I, which is 3, and we get 0 0.45 osmol. So 0 0.45 osmol from this here. So calculating osmolarity is, is, uh, is pretty simple. I think it's pretty straightforward. The only thing that's difficult, again, is just uh, making sure what, what our I value is here. So now we're just going to cover just a few more terms here. We're going to talk about isotonic solutions, hypertonic solutions, and hypotonic solutions. So I'm going to actually blow this up here. I, I just want to see this image here. So what you're looking at is a red blood cell. And red blood cells also go through osmosis. So here, um, the concentration of solute inside the red blood cell is equal to the concentration of solute on the outside of the blood cell. So any water that happens to pass into the red blood cell is the same exact amount of water that leaves the red blood cell. So a healthy red blood cell like this in a system where uh, the concentrations are equal inside and outside the red blood cell. There's no net gain or no net loss of water. That any water that goes in is the same amount of water that goes out. So this is what we consider uh, an isotonic solution. So an isotonic solution here. Uh, the next image we're going to look at it's kind of hard to tell. I wish I had a better image of this. Uh, it's kind of, it might be a little bit too difficult, but I'm going to describe what's happening here. Um, on the outside of the red blood cell, we have a high concentration of solute. While on the inside of the red blood cell, we have a low concentration of solute. And as we talked about osmosis before, is that water or solvent will go from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. So all of a sudden, because the concentration on the outside is higher, well, water starts to leave the red blood cell. And if you can't tell what's happening here, is this red blood cell shrinks. Is that water that's on the inside of this red blood cell passes through to the outside <coughs> to dilute that high concentration of solute. Because again, the system here wants both concentrations on the inside and the outside to be equal. So water has to leave the red blood cell in order to dilute this high concentration that's outside of it. So this is what we're going to consider. When this happens, uh, it's in a, a hypertonic solution. But that hypertonic solution, when, when red blood cells shrink like this, uh, we call that crenation. <clears throat> then we have our final one. This is a hypotonic solution. Not hypertonic, but hypotonic. And we have the opposite effect here is that inside we have a high concentration of solute, while on the outside we have a low concentration of solute. So what's going to happen here is, well, because we want both sides to be equal and through osmosis, water ends up entering 
this red blood cell. So water enters the red blood cell and we see that it's pretty round, it's pretty full. Um, is that they engorge like this and it does also have, there's a possibility that this will rip open and burst because there's so much water. Uh, the inside can only contain so much water that, that this might just burst open because the concentration may be a little bit too high. So when that occurs, uh, and if we see it burst, we do end up considering that lysis. Uh, so this may happen in a hypotonic solution. So here we have this red blood cell in a hypotonic solution. Uh, here we have it in a hypertonic solution and then we have what we consider uh, an isotonic solution. Uh, so I think that this will finish up uh, unit four, or sorry, unit five.